Peter, uh, in his day and time in First Peter, uh, wrote uh, when uh, the Christians at the time that he was writing to were on the leading edge of Neronian persecution. Uh, and so in uh, First Peter, uh, he is addressing the Christians who are beginning to experience persecution, uh, not unto blood yet, as Nero eventually got there, uh, but he wants to explain to them, because they're kind of, from our version, it's not a Greek word, but freaking out. Uh, <laughs> Uh, maybe it's freak out or something, some Greek word, I don't know. Um, but, uh, you know, how do you deal with a hostile culture uh, that slanders you, ridicules you, discriminates, uh, discriminates against you, wants to silence you, etc.? That was the Neronian culture. Uh, and so he told them not to be shocked about their treatment uh, and how they should respond. And he says in uh, chapter uh, 1, verse 6 of his first epistle that uh, they should be prepared for greater methods of persecution because once... Uh, a totalitarian leader like Nero uh, begins to gain ground on silencing his enemies, he just pursues more power. And so that's, that's nothing new under the sun, uh, and Nero was really good at that. So uh, as, the, as the opposition to the faith increased, uh, he gave the Christians a sound advice on how to function. Um, and I'll eventually get to Psalm 139 in case you have wondered what happened to Psalm. Remember, I always have a plan, right? Uh, and so I'll tie the two together for you. So he gave sound advice on how to function in a, in a hostile environment as a Christian. Uh, throughout his epistle, he uh, explains the, the importance of godly behavior, uh, that uh, sound doctrine should, that you understand sound doctrine, should, un, should be translated into sound practice. So I don't want to be a Christian who just knows sound doctrine. Uh, I have to actually apply that doctrine to my life and be conformed to the image of Christ. That speaks to the culture. Boy, does it even in our day and age. Uh, and then he also talked about, uh, later in his, his letter, the importance of not just living a godly life, but being able to handle uh, the questions that the godly, godly uh, are uh, received from the wor- people that don't walk with God. So in 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, verse 15, he says this. It says, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. So Christ should be paramount in your life. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this, notice he tells you how to do it. Do it with arrogance and hubris. No, I didn't say that. I totally wiped out those JWs at my door. Have you ever heard Christians brag like this? Why are you so quiet? You've done this? Yeah. Do it with gentleness and what? Respect. Uh, Keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against you, uh, your good behavior because they do, in Christ Jesus may be ashamed of their slander. So uh, what does he say for people in Neuronian times uh, when it's hard to be a Christian? evidence godly behavior to those around you who don't walk with God. So they'll begin to think, what is so different about them uh, that I've not got? And then number two, be prepared to answer their questions when they bring them against you, and don't be shocked if they're malicious towards you. Uh, And well, what we want to focus on is he says, uh, be always prepared. Uh, The word for, uh, to give an answer, uh, and this is the NIV, which I don't typically use, uh, but I like the translation in this text, to be prepared uh, is the Greek word apologia. Uh, and apologia was a, a term used in Grecian courtrooms by attorneys uh, for presenting evidence. So he says, when somebody asks you a question about your Christian faith, hey, why are you so happy when it, <laughs> so much mayhem going on around us? Um, you can say, well, uh, uh, let me answer that question for you. Uh, and that is a, a reasoned defense. Uh, and there's different ways to do that. But he, he said, you must be able to give an educated, logical, logically consistent defense uh, and evidence at hand for, well, why do I believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Why do I believe that Jesus is the only Son of God? Uh, what do I do about the problem of evil? And why is there pain and suffering? All those questions, you've studied them out, and you are ready to give an answer when someone asks you. You can give them the answers to those questions. So two things to do in Neuronian times when people are hostile. Number one is a test. You ready? What You should have an answer. Why? You already forgot. It's only been five minutes. Uh, you should evidence godly behavior, right? And then number two, you should always be ready to do what? Give an answer to somebody who asks you. I mean, if somebody asks you, why do you believe that Jesus is the Messiah? And you're going, I don't know, call Marty. Uh, no, don't, don't, do, don't do that. So this is really great advice, but why are we talking about that as we're looking at Psalm uh, 139? Well, because King David, long before Peter and long before Nero, uh, had constant opposition as a godly man uh, a moral man living as a politician of all things in a very evil time. Uh, and so when you go through the Psalter, because we have studied the Psalter now for a year, uh, we have covered many of the Psalms where uh, David pours out his heart about how hard it is to be a Christian 
in a, in a culture that's just opposed to you. So uh, if you go back to Psalm 12, Psalm 13, Psalm 22, Psalm 44, Psalm 86, I mean, like a thread all through the Psalter, he keeps talking about, oh, Lord, these mean-spirited people are trying to take me out. They're trying to silence me. Ha- deliver me, help me, protect me, give me wisdom, give me insight. Um, he, he is giving you advice long before Peter hit the planet of how to function in hostile times. That is Psalm 139. Uh, ancient advice on how to function when uh, the culture doesn't like your Christian faith and really doesn't like it. And so it leads to this, this question that uh, is, arises from the text, what is divine advice for living uh, for God in tough, testy times? That's the times in which we live. Much like David's, much like, much like Peter's, uh, and we can completely understand this if you're walking with God. So he's going to give us uh, four uh, levels of advice, what to do. Uh, and we want to start out with, with uh, his first one that's listed in verses 1 to 12, where he says, in, in difficult times, when, when the people of the world are opposed to you believing in absolute truth, absolute gospel of Christ, absolute deity of Christ, what should you do? Well, his advice is focus on God's person. Focus on the person of God. Why? Because the more that you understand God's person and his character, the better you are, you're equipped to function in the society in which you live. Um, it, and it, the concept is, is not when you're opposed, but, but uh, or, or if you're opposed, but, but when you're opposed. They're going to oppose you. Because uh, the scripture is clear. Jesus said in John 15, 18, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If the world hates you, keep in mind it hated me first. Uh, Paul, who experienced his share of opposition as a Christian, says in uh, his letter to Pastor Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, everyone, speaking of Christians, who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So if you tell me, I became a Christian so everybody will like me, uh, I got news for you today, what's going to happen? Are they all going to like you? No, because you'll be the person Living for God, remember, uh, sound doctrine leads to sound practice. You'll be living for God, and you also be giving answers to questions that they have that blow away their worldview. That might make them uncomfortable, but you've got to lead them to truth. And so uh, it, it, Jesus and Paul are telling you, you're going to face persecution in di- different ways. So how does he say to handle that? He says, well, focus on the person of God. So verse 1 says, this uh, psalm, uh, music, is for the director of music. It's uh, of David, or it's from David. It is a psalm or a song. So we have the, the lyrics. We just don't have the melody. He says that you, God, have searched and known me. Uh, you know me when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You, God, are familiar with all of my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, O oh Lord, know it completely. Unbelievable. So from a theological perspective, he's saying as you focus on God in tough times, uh, make sure that you understand the omniscience of God. That's what this is. It's the omniscience of God. He's all-knowing. He never has to learn anything, never has to study for a test, ne- never has to read a book to figure out what the thesis is and does a guy develop his thesis. He, he knows everything at all time. So if you walk down, God down to the beach and say, hey, how much sand is on the beach? Does he have to start counting? No, he, he totally knows how much is there instantly. Wouldn't you like to have that kind of mind when you were in school? Uh, and, and there were those times in school when I was taking tests where I'd actually say, God, please guide my hand, A, B, C, or D. I'm a super desperate student. But anyway, back to my sermon at hand. So he says, focus on the, the omniscience of God when times are Neronian around you. So now most read these, I mean, how many people, most Christians are familiar with Psalm 139. It is, it's a super famous Psalm. And a lot of Christians gain strength from it. How many would say you totally know this Psalm and, and you like it? Anybody? One, two, three, praise God. <laughs> I have somebody, thank you. Uh, well, you're gonna know it when we're done, if you don't know it. It's a super famous psalm. Focus on uh, the, the, the greatness of God's omniscience. Now, most read this and walk away with the presupposition that this is all about positive thinking. I mean, it's just a positive idea when you're thinking about the omniscience of God. This is not how David is presenting this as we're going to see. So David is going to move in his four proofs of what you should be doing in hostile times as a Christian. He's going to move from the omniscience of God that kind of makes him uneasy, kind of a negative kind of viewpoint, to then there's going to be a transition uh, to the positive side. We'll, we'll eventually get there. But he says, when I look at the, when I look at the God, God and his omniscience, it kind of makes me a little bit uneasy just speaking as a man. Um, this is the finer point we want to 
lend to this because he says here, God discerns his daily travels. Uh, that's what he says. You search me. Well, that word uh, in the Hebrew text, uh, zorita is the Hebrew word. It means to winnow wheat. So he basically says, God, you have winnowed me on a perpetual basis. Uh, good thing, bad thing. Well, it depends on how you want to look at it. Because if you believe daily that God has his mind on you and he sees you and he knows everything about you externally and internally, there's not a thought you can't think that he didn't know before the fact. There's no place you can go. He knew, he knew when you got up in the morning, when you went to bed at night. I mean, everything he knows. Well, then if he took your life and he threw it on a daily basis, say, say at the end of the day, God says, hey, it's 11 o'clock. I see you're going to bed. Let's winnow your life. Let's see how you did today. We'll throw the wheat in there along with the tares and we'll, we'll, we'll shake it around, we'll throw it up in the air. And when the wind blows, all the chaff, the sinful things you did away, and then we'll have that which is left, the wheat in the, in the basket. That's what we want. How much was be blown away? See, God knows all the chaff. You can fake me out all day long. You can deceive other people. You can deceive your wife, your husband, whoever you're dating, but you do not deceive God. He says he knows all things. So the thing that when he focuses on the person of God, he focuses on the fact that God knows your motivations. He knows why you do what you do, not the quantity of what you have done for him. He knows why you did all of that, the motivations. Well, that's kind of unsettling because man looks on the external, God looks on the internal and the external and knows them all completely. So David says, I've got clay feet as a king, as a politician, as a Christian, and these godless people push me and, and, and sometimes I respond in ways I shouldn't respond, but God, I know you're, you're, uh, you're, um, you're omniscient and that kind of holds me in check and makes me look upon you differently. He says in verse five, you hem me in from behind and before and you lay your hand upon me. This is not positive. Uh, the word for, if you read this in the Hebrew text, it's totally apparent that it's not positive uh, because when he says you hem me in from afar, uh, this is the word in Hebrew, the Hebrew word for hemming in is the Hebrew word sur. Sur means to besiege a city. <gasps> he says, God, on a daily basis, when I think about how much you know about me and why I do what I do and how I function, it's like I'm being besieged because it's like, I can't go to the left, to the right. It's like, you know everything. You know why I was talking to that girl, why I, was, why, why I said what I said in that report. You know everything. That does kind of make you kind of go, <clears throat> doesn't it? And if you're sitting there going, well, I have no problem with it. Well, we're praying for you, <laughs> all right? He also says, uh, your hand is upon me. Now, this is where you would, it helps you to know the Hebrew text because uh, there's uh, two words for hand that are used. Uh, yad is the normal word for hand, which speaks like the hand of God is upon me. That's a good thing. His strength, his power is upon you. That's not what he uses here. He doesn't use yad here. He uses a, another Hebrew word here, which means the cup of a hand, like, like the palm of a hand, like the hand that's used to strike. Read it that way. He says, God, with all that you know about me, it's kind of like your hand is ready to kind of bop me. Did you have parents? Did they ever bop you and get your attention? And you're so quiet now. Well, I, you know, I was a perfect child. I never did anything. Get real. You know, I mean, yeah, my, my dad got my attention a few times. You know, uh, you know, my sister would stab me in, in the rib cage with a, with a fork. I would respond in like kind. L Lex talionis, it's totally biblical. Eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. Uh, only when my dad uh, was dying of brain cancer did my sister come clean that Yes, I did that to Marty. I apologize. You're 61 years old. You're just not. Anyway, coming back to my sermon. It's, it's that kind of thing. When my dad would kind of like, like go, boom, what are you doing? You don't, you don't stab your sister with a fork. She stabbed me. No, she I didn't see it. That kind of thing. It's like God knows everything about you. And he's like ready to like kind of get your attention when you step out of line. He says, God, your, your, your knowledge is too amazing. So he sum, summarizes all this in verse six when he says, such knowledge, divine knowledge, is too what? It's too wonderful for me. It's too, it's too lofty for me to attain with my little finite mind. You know, my little, you know, 128 IQ. I can't even understand this. I mean, he says this is too wonderful for me. So the knowledge of God being wonderful, uh, the, the, the Hebrew word pele means knowledge that is uh, completely beyond human comprehension. That's why it's too wonderful. It's beyond anything you can understand. Ask God any question, and he knows the answer to that at all times. He says, that, that is unbelievable. And then he says, it's too lofty for me to attain. 
Uh, the word for it, lofty here uh, that he uses is the word that is used for a fortress. And he says, God, your knowledge is like an impregnable fortress that I as a human can only stand outside the wall of that city and think, man, all that he knows is beyond scope. I mean, I can't break through that to understand that kind of knowledge. None of us can, correct? Nobody can. So this leads to a question. How does the omniscience of God Almighty help you as a Christian when times are tough? I mean, how's that help you? Well, think of it this way. Since God knows you at that level as his child, he knows you at that, he's constantly sifting you to see how you're doing. How you doing today? Holy, unholy, doing things that are valuable or invaluable, things that are moral or immoral. He's constantly looking at your life and winnowing as a Christian. If he knows you at that level, then who would ever think well, he totally doesn't know what I'm going through at work. What would be the answer to that? Well, sure he would. Sure he would. See, he knows all of those things. Well, he certainly doesn't know what I'm going through with my non-Christian husband who's not saved and how he, you know, how he persecutes me. But sure, sure he knows about that because he even knows every single thing about you when you got up, when you went to bed, where you went, why you went with who you went, what you thought, why you thought it. He knows all that stuff. Then who could ever articulate the notion? Well, he doesn't know about that. No, the answer is, oh, he absolutely knows about that. And because he's omniscient, he's equipped to help you. The other thing is, if he knows everything at that level and you're not a Christian, I would be very afraid. Wouldn't you? Because when I stand before him on judgment day, when he calls me home, my, I can stand there not afraid because my life's covered by the blood of Christ. If you don't know Christ, you're on your own. And it says in uh, Luke chapter 8, verse 17, Jesus says, this is the Lord speaking, for there is nothing hidden that will not be disclosed on judgment day, nothing concealed that will not be known or brought out into the open. That's motivational. Because if you don't know God and you stand before him without the blood of Christ covering your sin, he's like, well, let's evaluate you. Uh, it says in book uh, Revelation chapter 20, verse 12, on judgment day, the great white throne judgment of the non-believer, not the believer, the, the non-believer, he says, I saw the dead and the great and small standing before the throne, this is of Christ, and the books were opened, my books, and there was another book opened, which was the book of life, and your name is either in that or not in that, and how does your name get in the book of life? Well, you trust Christ as Savior, and then the angel writes your name in. So your name's either in the book of life, or it's not in the book of life. So on Judgment Day, if you stand before Christ and you say, I'm not, I, I'm not a Christian, because they'll look for your name alphabetically in the book. <laughs> not here. And then... It says, there's another book was open, which is the book of uh, life. The dead were judged according to what they had done uh, as recorded in the books, plural. Recorded. What do you mean recorded? God recorded you. Talk about a data system, data retrieval. Everybody of all time, uh, let's, let's pull their name out. Uh, what is it? Well, here, Lord, is what they did. And uh, we know from what Jesus says in Matthew 7, they will actually argue with him on that day. They're so arrogant. Lord, in your name, didn't we not do all these things? And he says to them, you never, I never knew you. I, I didn't know you. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. So the omniscience of God is very motivational for a Christian because it tells me that if he knows all these things about me, then by definition, uh, it keeps me on a holy track to walk closely with him in godless times uh, and, and to also make sure that I tell my non-Christian friends, you have to give account one day to him. You ready? You ready? Then he focuses on the omnipresence of God. Verse seven, ask a question. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? Two, two rhetorical questions demanding what kind of response? Where can you go to get away from God? Florida. <laughs> Turks and Caicos, he, is, he is, he, is he there? Is he there? Is he in the Bahamas? Yeah, he's there, yeah. Well, I'll hide out in a casino. Is he there? He's there. Yeah, he's there. He says, where can I go? Where can I flee? Uh, answers, uh, nowhere. See, omnipresence, of, omniscience of God, then the omnipresence of God. So he's gonna give you four scenarios for you type A people that need four scenarios. Let me give you four situations that I, if I could possibly do these, what would be the outcome? So let's read them. If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, and if, if, I, if that allows me to settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand will guide me and your right hand will hold me fast. If, notice the conditional clause again, number three, if I say, surely the darkness will hide me, because God can't see in the dark. Uh, <laughs> yeah, don't tell me you ever have just lame thoughts about God. Don't you know God looks down and go, nah, I can see you. 
Back to the reading of the text. Uh, darkness will hide me and the light will become night around me. Even the darkness will not be dark to you and the night will shine like the day. Darkness is as light to you. Hello, wake up. So is there any place you can go to get away from God? Answer, no. So let's work our way through them. If it's possible for you to actually fly the speed of light, which is? I'm waiting to hear the sound traveling to me. Yes. Well, that's true to a point, but I, I read that it was 186,000 miles per second, but it's really 186,282,000 miles per second, but just saying. But you're very close. So you get into heaven or something like that. So, so, so anyway, if you could fly that fast, if your body could do it, if you could fly that fast, uh, it would take you 26,000, 20 years to go halfway across the Milky Way galaxy. Huh? You live in the Milky Way galaxy. Traveling that fast, it would take you 26,000, 20 years to go halfway across the Milky Way. And if you got to halfway across the Milky Way, who's there? God. And you're thinking, man, I totally ditched him. Uh, no, 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 you didn't. No, he's, he's there. Uh, let's move on. It's too convicting. Uh, if you build a vessel where you can withstand the pressure of descending into the Mariana Trench, uh, which is, you know, a uh, crescent-shaped trench that submariners know, uh, it's just, you know, just below Japan. Uh, if you went down 36,000, 37 feet down into the Mariana Trench, you were able to withstand the pressure down there and thought, I've totally lost God here. He cannot see me down here. Who's going to meet you there? God. God's like, hey, I'm glad you're here. God, God's there. God's, God's there. Um, but notice what he says. Even if you were to go down, down there, he, he's there. He says, if you could fly with the speed of the breaking morning dawn, uh, we had a staff retreat this week. We're off in the, I don't know where we were, toward West Virginia, off in the mountain. It was awesome. Beautiful rolling hills. I got up one morning before we had our first staff session, went out walking at daybreak. I see the sun coming up, the sun is hitting all the hills, all the color of the, I had to stop and film it and then send it to my wife. Like, this is, this is, this is amazing. But how quickly did the sun rise and, and illuminate the entire landscape? You know, he said, if I, could, if I could fly that fast, if I could go that fast and get to that part of the earth, you know, that's the remotest part of the earth and think that you're not there, I, I would have thought wrong because you're there, you're there. Why? Because the guy who loves me and guides me, he, he would be there. And this is where he switches to the positive. He says, God, when I think about your, 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 om your omnipresence, he, he says, even there you would be my guide and, and giving me stability because he's omniscient. He says, if I could descend to the deepest place on the planet, which according to what I've read, and it may be wrong, but this is what I found on the internet. No, it wasn't Wikipedia. But uh, Veronica, uh, uh, this particular uh, cave uh, in over toward Russia is 7,257 feet deep. Who in their right mind would be a spelunker and go down that shaft? Not I. And if you went down there without, you know, any kind of lighting, I mean, talk about the darkness. And Because I've been in caves before, deep caves, when they turn the lights off in Arizona when I was growing up. And when they turn the lights off, your rods and cones and your eyes, like in a theater, when you walk in late and you've got the drinks and everything, the popcorn, and you can't see your family to sit down, so you've got to wait a few minutes. Because I've actually sat on people before. Have you done this? <laughs> you ever done this? Like, excuse, excuse me. Yeah, it wasn't your wife. And it's like, hey. Um, but if you go into a cave and you go down, the, the rods and the cones never adjust. I've done it. It's thick darkness. He says, if I were to go down there and think that you're not going to be there, God, uh, you'd be there. You'd be even there. So when you look at the times in which you live and you think, man, gosh, it's so hard, and uh, immoral people and, and ungodly people and ungodly ideologies and worldviews, and it's everywhere, and I can't get away from it, and, and they don't like me at work because I, I believe in absolute truth, and etc. God says, well, don't fear. I am the God who who's with you. I know all about that, and, uh, you, uh, and I'm, I'm with you every step of the way. Remember what Jesus said, Hebrews 13, verse 5, I will never, I will never do what? Leave you. I will never leave you, nor forsake you, and God fulfills his word. So focus on God. Focus on God's plan, verses 13 to 18. Uh, he says, for you created my innermost most being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made, 
Your works are too wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden for you when I was made in the secret place, talking about his mother's womb, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw in my mom's womb my unformed body. Uh, A lot of Christians know this text. This is an amazing text. It's a great one to memorize. Uh, Because he says when you you are facing evil, in evil times, uh, focus on God's person, focus on God's plan for you, because God is the one who specifically made you. Now, just as a side note, this completely destroys evolution. How so? Well, because God made you. I mean, complete. And think about how he made you, because your your body is specified complexity at all levels, and all of them are contingent upon each other. So you have different systems in your body, do you not? Like the muscular system that helps you sit in the chair, correct? Nervous system, cardiovascular system. Skeletal, reproductive, digestive, urinary, I mean, on and on it goes. All those overlapping systems all, all, all work in perfect function together, and you think they all evolved? <laughs> I think not, because they couldn't have logically evolved. Or no one would have ever lived. But anyway, back to my sermon. He says, God, you, you, you knit me together. I mean, you're like a weaver in my mother's womb making me. So this blows away, ev- this bo- blows away evolution. It blows away uh, the pro-choice people. How so? Who in their right mind would ever tamper with what God makes? Not I. Who would ever reach into the womb and eliminate a little baby? Well, it's just, it's just a mass. It's, it's really nothing, really. What does this text say? Uh, God, you knit me together. You, you knit me together. Who would ever think that they had the ability to mess with what God was knitting, weaving? See, you're on God's loom. This uh, particular text also blows away transgenderism. And I know because when I was working on my dissertation on transgenderism for my doctorate back in the day, this is one of the texts that I use. Because think of it this way. Uh, The basic premise is, well, I'm I'm a man living in a a woman's body. My mind tells me, like, uh, exact, the opposite of that. But what does this text say? No, God made you, male or female, and he did not make a mistake. Do you understand? This is so important. He made you exactly who you are. And he, he, exactly who you are. And he started out in, the, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, making male and females. He hasn't changed anything. So in your mind, what you're thinking is not matching reality. And so that's not of God. God made you just who you are. So embrace who you are. Uh, that's the wonder of this text. He, he made you. He wove you together. And you are fearfully and wonderfully made. The complexity of how you are. And God makes no mistakes. And I know he doesn't make mistakes. Because in John chapter 9, verses 1 to 12, if you want to go read it, uh, they bring a little boy to Jesus one day who's blind. And they say, who sinned? This young boy or his parents? That he's born this way. It's a mistake. What Jesus tell him? It's not a mistake. That little boy was born blind because I'm going to heal him. And when I heal him, it's, he's, it's, he's, he's here to evidence my deity. See, God doesn't make mistakes. You're not a mistake. You're not a mistake because God made you. So back to my sermon. He's talking about God's plan because think of it this way. If God put all of that effort into making you, then he has a plan for you. He didn't just make you and went, okay, I'm on to the next one. No, he made you and said, no, I got special things for you. Notice what it says. He says, all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. I mean, we could spend several Sundays talking about this. When you made me, you had in your mind, God, what you intended for me to do in my lifetime. Now, I have a free will, so do you. But this is, God made me, and he it wrote down in his book, I wonder what I would like to see the, in the life of that baby. This is another reason why you wouldn't want to mess with what God's doing in the womb. God's got a plan for that child. Who would want to mess with God's plan? He says, you ordained for me. You wrote him in a book in heaven, and this is what he, you want to see. This, this is um, interesting because there's a tension between God's sovereignty and that he knows all things, but also the fact that I have a free will. Uh, and, and I have the free will to choose, and I have, his will for me is that I would be a godly man. That's what David is saying, that I have the option in, a go- in, in intense, hostile times to live in a righteous way. It's my choice. That's what you've ordained for me. Um, this is why you get into all the text like Romans 12, 1, where Paul says, therefore... I urge you, brothers and sisters, as Christians, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, uh, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. 
do not conform to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renew renewing of your mind. D don't get into all the evil ideologies of the world that are affecting your mind and affect your practice. No, let your mind be transformed by you submitting to me, to my word, to the spirit, and be transformed in your mind to think like Christ thinks. See, that's my choice to do that on a daily basis. That's, that's your choice as a Christian on a daily basis to choose to live in a holy way. Uh, and God says, hey, that's what I ordained for you. Uh, Galatians chapter five, Paul puts it this way. But the fruit of the spirit is, well, if I'm walking with God, how, do I, how will I know it? Well, there's love about me. There's a lot of joy. I have peace, forbearance, kind. I'm a kind person. There's goodness. I'm faithful. I don't desert friends. Don't desert, don't, won't desert a wife. Won't desert uh, children. You know, I'm, I'm faithful. Uh, there's gentleness. There's self-control. Again, such things, there's no law. So he says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. He says, no, the, the, the greatest way to live is lean on the Spirit of God. That's your daily choice as a Christian and walk according to the power of the Spirit. So God has ordained that you walk in the Spirit and that you are transformed as a Christian. But David says, you know, I have the free will to choose that. But you have specifically made me God to be a godly woman or a godly man. Question is, are you fulfilling said role? Now, now think about it this way. If God designs every single person and has a plan for them, uh, he's going to hold you accountable to how you respond to his revelation. That's the thing. Uh, he says in verse 17, how precious to me are your thoughts, O God, how vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. He says, how precious are your thoughts. What he, what the Hebrew word there is really the word intention. He, read it this way. How precious are your intentions, O God. In light of the fact you specifically designed me to be who I am, wrote in your book what you would want to see in my lifetime, I have the free will to pursue those or not, and you will judge me accordingly, when I think about all that you want from me, God, he says, it blows my mind of all the intentions you have for me. You know, I sat down at my desk the other day and started writing down all the intentions God wants from my life. That's another sermon. Series. <laughs> he wants you to love him with all your heart, soul, and mind, and your neighbor as yourself. He, he wants you to trust in his sovereign leadership no matter what. He, he wants you to build a marriage which reflects the unity of the Trinity. Uh, he, he wants you to be a young person who's in control of your body. And on and on is what he wants from you. And when you live that way, then you transform your culture because they've never seen anybody like you before. Number three, he says, focus on the passion of God, verses 19 to 22. Now, I must say, as we wrap up here, um, I wish this psalm ended it with, with verse 18. Because don't you kind of run into text, you're thinking, why did he throw that in there? And so it's, he doesn't end on the easy part of verse 18. He says, no, you need to focus on the heart of God. What is the heart of God? Verse 19. He says, focus on God's passion. What's his passion? He says, oh, if only you, God, would slay the wicked. Away from me, you who are blood first thirsty, those who are trying to take out the king. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. They use your name in vain all the time. It's a cuss word. He says, do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord, and abhor those who are in rebellion against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. Do you see why I wish he would have left that verse out? This is why preaching expositionally through the text, you can't pass stuff that's difficult. He's telling him, God, might I hate what you hate? Our culture's thinking, oh, he said hate. He said hate. Did he say hate? Did he say hate? Yeah, he did. I can't tell you he didn't say hate. Now, here's the thing. This is a whole other sermon series. It's job security for me, by the way. Um, it's a whole other sermon series. But you think about it. Uh, once you embrace that God is, ontologically, is that he is, then he's the ultimate reference of all truth, right? Then whatever he is for or whatever he is against, I, by definition, as his child, must be that. My cult, so he's all truth. My culture says all truth is relative to the person. That's called the coherence view of truth. So as long as our little group over here coheres together and believes this to be true, even if defies logic, morality, etc., we believe it to be true, so it's ipso facto true. That's our culture, balkanized around truth. That's why you can't have a discussion with anybody. Well, this, it's truth to me. It was truth to me. It was truth to me. It's diametrically opposed. doesn't matter. It's all true. Huh? He, he says, God, once you, once you exist, then what you hate 
and abhor is what I hate and abhor. See, I went all throughout the Old and New Testaments and recorded all the verses of things that God hates. This is another sermon, as I told you. Does God hate things? Yeah, why? Because he's holy. He's holy. Uh, Psalm 45, you love righteousness and hate wickedness. So, uh, Proverbs 8, to fear the Lord is to hate evil. Um, Isaiah 1, your new moon feast and your appointed festivals, I hate, God says, with all my being. Your fake worship you bring to me, God says, I hate it because I see your heart. Zechariah 8, do not plot evil against each other. Do not swear falsely. I hate all of this lying. I mean, on and on it goes. So once I say God is the ultimate reference point, then I can say there's things we should abhor and things we don't abhor. The thing about our culture is they say you should have no hate, no abhorrence toward anything as if everything's acceptable, but they don't like you in your position. They're hypocrites. They abhor you. That's really the Hebrew word is to abhor. But really, what does that mean? I'll illustrate, give you an illustration. It's kind of gross, but it works. When I was a kid, I, I grew up near a railroad track. My family was poor. We lived near, lived near a switchyard, and I played near the tracks all the time. One day, we were playing hide and seek, uh, and we found an abandoned uh, lot with a bunch of debris, and we found a hole. And so me and my friend Kenny thought that's a great place to hide. So we opened the door, this rusty old door, and we both jumped in. It was an abandoned septic tank. I, to I told you it was gross. <laughs> I told you. It was an abandoned septic tank. It had been there for years. And once we got down in there, we realized where we were. I abhor abandoned septic tanks. <laughs> I hate them. Now all of a sudden you do too, right? Whoa. See? So when he says, when you think about God, but if God is the absolute reference for what is true, then what he hates because he's holy, I must take what I think, park it, and go, man, if God hates evil, uh, then I, I've got to abhor it. If I abhor it, I'm not climbing in that hole. You follow me? How do you live in godless days? You, you abhor what God abhors. And then lastly, verse 23, this is, this is risky. He says, focus on God proving you. God, uh, what do I want from you? I want you to search me. God, know my heart. Uh, then he says, test me. Know what's freaking me out. Uh, anxious thoughts. Uh, see if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. There is no greater thing than for a godly man, godly woman to come before God and say, God, you know all about me anyway. <laughs> and you see all that I do and why I do it. Would you please, from my perspective, test my life and show me, is there anything in my life as a man, as a father, as a husband, as a employee for the government, whatever. Is there anything in my, in my life that's evil, which you hate? Would you please show me that? If you ask God that today, guess when you're going to get an answer? Today. Who would be afraid to ask God that? Most. But it's the greatest thing you can do because it leads to holiness, and holiness is what our, life, our lives need before God who is holy. And it's the very thing our culture needs to see is a holy man and a holy woman because it leads to them saying, why are you different? And the hope that you have is Christ. Let's pray. God, thank you for the power of the word, uh, the depth of the word, and you can spend a lifetime peering into it. And it, is, it does make us uncomfortable because it challenges us because we are bought into a world system. Help our thinking to be your thinking, our lives, the evidence, what we believe about you. And may we truly lead many people into the kingdom of Christ because we've lived for you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.